Well, greetings to everyone. I hope this finds you well. If you have a Bible with you today, I invite you to go ahead and take it out and turn to our scripture reading, which is going to come from 2 Peter chapter 1. Well, today we are continuing on with our fall series on the order of redemption. And believe it or not, we are actually drawing pretty close to the end of this study. I will be gone next Sunday morning to do a wedding down in Austin for uh, a former member of the church in Sladen. And so two weeks from today, we will have our final lesson on the order of redemption. And then we'll be moving the next week right into the Advent and Christmas season. It's kind of hard to believe that it's already that time of year again. But um, perhaps all of us are ready to bring 2020 to a close in the hopes that there are better things ahead in 2021. Only God knows whether that's actually going to be true or not, but we can certainly hope and pray for it to be so. At this phase in our study of the order of redemption, we have been looking at the gifts that come from our faith in Christ and our baptism. The first thing that we saw is that we are now justified, which means we are declared to be in a right relationship with God. And the second thing we learned two weeks ago now was that we have all been adopted into God's family. God is now our Father, and we are His children, and we have been made an heir of all the promises of God as brothers and sisters of Jesus Christ. These two things, justification and adoption, are very important things for us to internalize, because when we do so, They give us a sense of security to know that we are in the right with God and that we have been adopted into his family and that our father protects us as any jealous father would for his children. This gives us the security to pursue what comes next in the order of redemption. And what is it that comes next? It is the process of sanctification. Now, sanctification is another big theological word, much like justification, but really that has a simple meaning once you understand what it is. Remember, justification is a big word that simply means to be declared in the right. It's a legal term that lets us know that we are now in good standing with God, who is our judge. Well, if justification means to be declared to be in the right, sanctification is the process of how God goes about actually making us right. Sanctification is a big word that simply means our growth in holiness. And this is a very important element in our spiritual life that sometimes is left out of today's religious context. With all of the emphasis on grace that has been prevalent for the last number of decades, And uh, by the way, uh, I think that's a very good thing. I would not want to go back to our more legalistic days. But with all of this emphasis on grace, it is possible that we can forget that we are called to strive for a holy life. Remember, the Bible says in both the Old Testament and the New, without holiness, no one will see God. But a question that is worthy of asking this morning is, how do we become holy? Well, that's going to be the primary subject of our lesson today. But before we get too deep into that, we do need to pause and read our text for today. I hope by now that you have joined me in 2 Peter chapter 1. And if you have, I want to begin reading in verse 3, and we'll read all the way down through verse 11. Join me if you would in our text. His divine power has given us everything that we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these he has given us his very great and precious promises so that through them you may participate in the divine nature and escape the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. For this very reason, that is, because his divine power has given us everything for godliness. Make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to goodness knowledge, and to knowledge self-control, and to self-control perseverance, 
and to perseverance, godliness, and to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But if anyone does not have them, he is nearsighted and blind, and has forgotten that he has been cleansed from his past sins. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, be all the more eager to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never fall, and you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I think it is likely true that every preacher has something that becomes a main focus of emphasis for him. This emphasis likely grows out of several things. Certainly his own personality is involved along with whatever gifts that he's been equipped with by God. But I think it is also true that it develops out of the experience of his relationship with God. For example, some preachers really have a strong focus on doctrinal truth. Uh, these kind of men find the majority of their ministry in, in digging out and presenting to others the truth of God's word, and they feel a very strong need to defend that truth against error. Other types of men put more focus on organizational leadership. Preaching, of course, is still a part of their job, as the title would indicate, but uh, sometimes they see it as only one aspect of the greater work that they are called to do, and among the most important of those works is the organization of the body's life. Still others might focus more on community outreach or evangelism, or there is the fellowship of the body, or perhaps a ministry to the sick and those who are shut in and unable to come to church. If I was a mind to here today, I could probably spend our whole time together just talking about the different kind of emphasis that men have when it comes to the job of being a preacher or a minister. Now, it would be natural at this point to ask whether or not I have a particular emphasis, and of course the answer is yes, I do. Uh, there might be several things that I would point to that are of particular importance to me, but right at the very top of that list is the subject of spiritual growth. If you were to ask me why that is such a strong emphasis of mine, I think it becomes, or excuse me, I think it comes out of both of my experience growing up in the church and also some of the very things that I have learned since those years. Uh, when I was growing up in the church, I don't think there was a very clear teaching on the subject of progress and holiness. Uh, it's not that holiness, and holiness was not emphasized. I mean, it certainly was emphasized. However, I do think that there was a lack of clarity on exactly how that kind of growth takes place. The emphasis that I learned about holiness in the church was on willpower. Okay, Now, I'm not saying that that was the official teaching, but I am saying that's what I absorbed in one way or another. I learned that we are in a battle against sin, that the flesh wages war against the spirit. And so the way that we grow in holiness is to do head-on battle with our temptations to sin, and we use our willpower to overcome the negative temptations in our life. Well, here was the problem with that approach. I found out that my willpower was pretty weak. Whenever I would try to go to battle against the desires of my sinful nature, rather than those things getting less strong in my life, they actually got stronger. And the stronger they got, the more I failed, and the more I failed, the more guilt I felt, and it kept me grinding it out in this endless circle of, of battle and failure. It was not until I was introduced to some of the great writers on the spiritual life that I began to learn a better way. There are two things that I learned about spiritual growth from such people. Number one, I learned that holiness is not about behavior management. This is one of the easiest mistakes we can make in the spiritual life. 
Because holiness does result in a change in life, it is tempting to think that the whole issue is how I change my outward behavior so that it matches up with this particular standard. But as I've already indicated, whenever I simply just tried to change my behavior, I was not able to sustain it for any length of period of time. And so it was here that I began to learn for the first time that behavior management is not actually where you begin in the spiritual life. Yes, that is the end result. Your behavior will ultimately change. But what must happen before true behavioral changes can take place is that our inward person must be changed. To talk about the inward person is another way of talking about the heart. And when the heart or the inward person is changed, then behavior comes naturally and it can be sustained. But when you're simply focusing on behavior alone, it always leads to failure. That is why Jesus says that a bad tree cannot produce good fruit and a good tree cannot produce bad fruit. Uh, another analogy that Jesus used was clean the inside of the dish and the outside will be clean too. Okay, That's a, a very important realization. The second thing that I learned was this. I don't have direct access to those deep inner places where that kind of change needs to take place. Ultimately, God must affect that change. However, that does not mean that I'm simply passive in the process. It was these two insights that helped me see that there are, uh, there are two things that have to come together for our growth and holiness to take place. One is a work that only God can do, but the other is something that we actually contribute to. This twofold truth is actually right here in our biblical text here in 2 Peter chapter 1. It's one of the best places in all of the Bible to see it. So without walking you through the whole text here today, you will notice again in verse 3 that Peter says, His divine power has given us everything that we need for life and godliness. In other words, we are not lacking in anything we need to grow in our life of godliness. Through these, Peter goes on to say in verse 4, God has given us his very great and precious promises, notice this, so that you can participate in the divine nature. That is the ultimate goal of our life in God. It is to be brought into God's own life so that we can participate in his divine nature. He not only wants to give us the gift of forgiveness, which lets us off the hook, but he actually wants to draw us into his own life so that we can share in his power of his life and nature. But then, if you will skip down to verse 5, Peter goes on to give us the other half of this. He says, for this reason, that is, because God has given us all of his promises so that we can participate in the divine nature, make every effort to add to your faith. So both of these things are right here in our text in regard to our growth and holiness. On the one hand, God has provided all that we need in order to participate in the divine nature. On the other hand, we must make every effort. Well, how do we do these two things? How do these two things go together? Let's flesh it out in a little more detail. First of all, his divine power has given us everything that we need for life and godliness. It is very important for us to understand that God would not ask anything of, it, of us that he himself was not going to help to provide. He knows we are weak creatures. He knows that we are made of dust and are very limited in our abilities. And so God takes the initiative to do for us what we could not do on our own. Now, we could rightfully ask here, how does God go about doing that? 
Well, listen, that could be a sermon all its own, but just to state it briefly, God primarily does this through the providential ordering of our lives. He arranges some of the circumstances in our life so that we encounter things that are going to push us to grow. Sometimes these things can be good and pleasant, like a, a new friend or a, a productive study or maybe an unanticipated blessing. But oftentimes it is through hardship and suffering that God pushes us into situations that we would not willingly enter into ourselves. And through our perseverance through those trials, God produces a, a greater character in us. This is what Paul says in Romans chapter 5. He says, not only do we rejoice in the hope of glory, but we also rejoice in our sufferings. For we know that our sufferings produce patience, and patience produces character, and character in turn increases our hope. So that is one way that God leads us to greater holiness. He providentially orders our lives, and that is the primary way. But the second way is also important. Peter says, make every effort to add to, and then he lists a number of things. Add to our faith, our goodness, our knowledge, our self-control, our godliness, and so on. Now, one of the ways that we could go about looking into this is that we could examine each one of these things that Paul mentions here in this list and how they contribute to our life of holiness. But for our purposes today, I don't think we need to do that. Number one, I really haven't left us the time to do that. But secondly, even if we examine each one of them, it still leaves us with the primary question. <clears throat> How do we grow in all of these things? Well, the first principle is you do have to fake it until you make it. There are times when we don't feel like being kind but we should make every effort to be kind anyways. There are times when we don't feel like doing good, but we should make every effort to do good anyways. By doing this, we actually strengthen our muscles that, that will make it more natural for us to act in good ways in the future. But this does go back to what I was saying before. Fake it until you make it is primarily about willpower. And there is an element of practice to this which is helpful, but it is primarily willpower, and we have already acknowledged willpower is not enough on its own. In order to sustain this, we need deep inward change. And the way to participate in our own deep inward change is the practice of the spiritual disciplines. Spiritual disciplines which include things like Bible study and prayer, Prolonged times of silence and solitude, fasting, giving, celebration, holy secrecy, service to others, giving, and so on. These are ways that we put ourselves before God, and God promises to respond to our action by de doing a deep inward work in us that we could not do in our natural power. You see, spiritual disciplines are kind of like what spring training is to the baseball player. Spiritual disciplines are what practice is to the piano player. You take actions that are within your own power so that in time you are enabled to do more than you can do in the moment simply by trying to exercise your willpower. And as we draw near to God through these practices, God, in turn, will draw near to us, and his presence, which is a consuming fire, will change us on the inside. And when we have been changed on the inside, the outward behavior of holiness will just naturally flow. So what we see with sanctification here this morning is that it is both a gift and it does involve some personal effort. It's not effort through willpower, but it is the indirect effort of practices that put us before the presence of a holy and transforming God. 
But this raises one last question that we need to consider as we close here today. Why would we want to do all of this? I mean, if we're in a saved condition anyways, why would we want to go to all this effort? Three things. First, remember what the scriptures say. Without holiness, no one will see God. You don't get to skip this process. Either you will do it now or you will do it later, but no one gets to see God without being sanctified. Second, there is a joy and a power that comes from a holy life. Yes, it may be true that sin has its joy in the moment, but true and lasting peace and power for living comes from an inward goodness of a God-transformed self. But then third, remember that we will be rewarded in the future based on our faithfulness now. Those who do not squander the time that God has given them will be richly rewarded for their efforts. Some things to think about until we meet again in two weeks. God bless you.